Our next speaker is the Director of Veteran Affairs Services of Cal uh, the California State University, Long Beach. He developed the Vet Ally, Ally Program and is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Please welcome Dr. Marshall Thomas. Good morning, can you all hear me? I get the special microphone today. If you can't hear me in the back, I can turn it up. We're good? All right, fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce myself first. That way you know who's talking to you for the next 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And I like to do that with some pictures because I like to remember that I was once thinner. <laughs> I once used to have to worry about bad hair days. This is not the case anymore. Um, I was in the Marine Corps from 1986 to 1992. I joined when I was 13 years old. <laughs> and I'm sure that skinny guy is in here somewhere. I'm not sure where. Um, today I serve as the Director of Veterans Affairs Services at Cal State Long Beach. And I appreciate you all for, for being here today and listening to me speak. What you're going to hear today is a little portion of the VetNet Ally program that we put together at Cal State Long Beach in 2010 to help create a sense of awareness with our faculty and staff and administrators on our campus and to create a welcoming environment for veterans who are coming to the school. The way we do that is we give folks that go through our four-hour seminar a sticker that looks like this one that they can put on their workspace so that when a student veteran walks by, they see something that says, I am your friend. I'm an ally to you. We've been very fortunate because we've had folks from a lot of different universities and college come to our school and observe it. And our program's been adopted at UC Irvine, uh, Santa Monica City College, Long Beach City College has seen our presentation, and we've been fortunate to present to, I love this acronym, C-A-S-F-A-A. -A. Anyone know what that stands for? I, I believe it's Ca <laughs> California Association of Student Financial Advisors. I think I got that right. Aid Financial Aid Administrators, okay. I couldn't keep it straight either. And in and, and NASPA, uh, also in Philadelphia last year. Now. I'm doing this alone today, but I cannot, I cannot in good conscience not mention my two partners in this endeavor, uh, Michael Barraza, who's one of our staff psychologists, and Patrick O'Rourke, who is my predecessor as the Director of Veterans Affairs at Cal State Long Beach. All right, so what are we gonna do today? Well, I was asked to come and talk to you about military culture. We recognize that a lot of folks that are working in community colleges and universities have not served in the military, so it's important to kind of understand a little bit about what it is to be a veteran. So we're going to talk a little bit about the numbers of veterans that we have. How does someone become a veteran? Why people join? Then we're going to do a, what I like to call military 101. What happens when you get there? And then challenges for student veterans, what happens when you get out? Okay. So, to start with, who's a veteran? Anyone care to answer that? Some of us don't really think about that too much, but what is a veteran? Well, we have five military services, okay? They're represented here. We have the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard. Now, the first four of those are part of the Department of Defense. Some people may not know this. The Coast Guard is actually part of the Department of Homeland Security, though they can be activated to be part of the Navy in times of conflict. And there are certainly a lot of Coast Guardsmen who are overseas right now in our combat areas. Okay. So we say a veteran is anyone who has worn the uniform of any of those services. Okay. Now, sometimes we distinguish between people who have been in combat, combat veterans, and those who have not been in combat. But as educators, we want to consider everyone to be a veteran. We're not concerned about that. Anyone who served potentially was a combat veteran. They all signed saying, I'll go and do whatever my service asked me to do. Okay. And as the secretary mentioned, um, we have active duty and we have reserve. Okay. So when we use the term service member, we're talking about people who are currently serving. And you have a lot of those folks in your community colleges. 
Many years ago, I was one of those as well. I started at Miracosta College. I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, a lot of Marines that go there. And then later, Golden West, before I went on to uh, Long Beach State. All right, so let's talk about veterans by the numbers. This is pretty impressive. You know, California has more veterans than any other state. Does that surprise anyone? I don't think so. About 2,166,000 are female, a million eight are male. Okay. It's pretty representative. Now I'm going to show you the CSULB numbers for, for a reason. And that is that, you know, in spring we had 342 veterans. In fall, this fall, we have about 356. That's actually not that many people if you think about it. We've got 35,000 students on our campus. So about 1% of our student, students are veterans. Now, what does that mean? That means they're all going to your schools. They're all going to your schools. And guess where they want to go? They want to go to our schools. So we have to make sure that we provide a pathway for them to get from the community college system into the CSU. I saw some of our application numbers. You know the application deadline, for those of you that are keeping track, was two days ago. I know Cal State Long Beach had 58,000 applications for freshmen and somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 or 14,000 applications for transfer students. That's a lot of people trying to move from one system to another one. All right, now let's do a little bit of a reality check here. I know that's the official number of veterans at our school, but we have more veterans than that that we're using the GI Bill. So what does that mean? That means that when people are applying, when our students are applying to our schools, they're not indicating that they're veterans on their application. Okay? This, is a, this is an important thing to note because they might not be doing it at your schools either. So we kind of have to provide an open line of communication so once they get to us, they'll let us know that they're veterans. Okay, so active duty by service branch. Who are our veterans? Well, it breaks down kind of like this. The Army is obviously the largest service. The Navy is the second largest. The Air Force, well, Air Force and Navy are about the same size. Got a lot of Marines in California, especially if you are in any of the San Diego community colleges, you know there are a lot of Marines around here, right? Because they're in your school. Now this is an interesting slide, and I know it's a little hard to see from the back, but this talks about education level of the people that are serving. On the left-hand side, we see the, the numbers for the U.S. overall. And only about 86% of the U.S. population are high school graduates. But those that are in the military, it's 99%. Okay. So they're better educated than the rest of the country overall at the high school level. Folks with bachelor's degrees starts to change a little bit. 27% of Americans have bachelor's degrees, only 18% of the people in the military. Advanced degrees, 9% for the U.S., 7% for those in the military. Okay. Now, what we want to do is make sure when they get out, we're changing those last numbers, right? That's what we're here for. By age, this is definitely not a shock. 45% of the people that are serving in the military right now are under the age of 25. About 86% men, 14% women. I will tell you that varies a lot by service. There, the percentage of women in the Air Force is a lot higher than the percentage of women in the Marine Corps, for example. Ethnicity, you know, is close to matching the population overall. It's close. Uh, I think the areas that are a little bit differently represented are uh, the Hispanic population in the military is actually lower than the U.S. as a whole. And the African American uh, population in the military I think is a little bit higher than the rest of the population in the U.S. So why do we care? Why are veterans any different than any other student that we have on our campus? Well, to start with, they took a different path. They didn't go straight from high school into college. That's, that's one thing. But there are some other factors as well. We, we uh, polled our students last year to find out how many of them had been in combat. 29% had gone into combat situation at least once, one tour. 22% two tours. 10% other, which usually means more than two. Okay. Most of your traditional students have not been in combat situations. That makes our combat vets or our veterans a little bit different. Now, this is in fall of 2010. In spring, notice the numbers are changing 
we actually have more, a higher percentage of our students who have been in combat situations for more than one tour. They're bringing some of that back with them, right, up here. Sometimes physically, sometimes in, in their minds. Okay. Now, the other thing is, I said, where are our students coming from? Well, our students are coming from you for the most part. Long Beach City, Coastline, LA County, LA City should be, Orange County, other community colleges, some out of states. But look at this. This is how many different schools that our, our people have attended. 35% of the veterans that are transferring into the Cal State have been to two or more colleges, community colleges, before they get to the university. That's a transcript nightmare, right? And you know that because you're having to put them all together and figure out how many units they have to get before they can even apply. All right, so let's talk about the life cycle of a veteran. How do you become a veteran? Well, the first thing we need to decide is, well, why is it that people join the service to begin with? There's a lot of reasons, and a lot of people join. We have 280,000 people join the military service each year, 280,000. And they do that for a variety of reasons. Why do we need so many? Well, some people get to the end of their four-year enlistment and they get out. Other people spend 20 years or 30 years and retire. We've got to replace those people. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years, we've actually had several thousand people that just didn't come home. And those folks have to be replaced as well. Okay. That's the reason we have that, such a high turnover rate. Now, let's play a little bit of Jeopardy here. Everyone ready? Our category today is military enlistments. And here is the answer. 11%. Anyone care to guess the question? Do I have to do the music? Do, 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 do. That is the percentage of military enlistments that come from the state of California. 11% of all military enlistments in 2010 came from this state. Guess where they're gonna come back to when they get out of the service? You, they're gonna come back to school. They're gonna come back to school. All right, so is this why they joined? Because we have great recruiting posters and great recruiters? <laughs> Uncle Sam wants you, right? Why else do people join besides great recruiting tools? Anybody? Family legacy. You know, we have people that can trace their family lineage way, way back, all the way to the Revolutionary War, and someone in each generation has served. Okay, so family legacy. I heard some stuff over here, too. Why else? Benefits. <laughs> Duty. They want to fight. That's right. They do. 9-11, right? We need to take care of that problem. Way back in the back. Money for school. Money, money for school. That GI Bill, right? Absolutely. Well, we did a little bit of research, and we found that there are several reasons that people join. Most people don't join for one single reason. They usually join for a, a combination of factors, right? It could be the family legacy. It could be the benefits. Adventure. You want to see the world. Okay. I grew up in a little town in Oklahoma. I need to get out of there. <laughs> yeah. When I give directions about how to get to my parents' house, I can't even give road names. I tell them, when the road curves, the Highway 66 curves, you don't. You just keep going straight on the dirt road. <laughs> And then turn on the next dirt road, and that's how you get there. Yes, I wanted some adventure. I wanted to come back to California. Patriotism. Patriotism. Family tradition. It's a rite of passage. We don't have a lot of those in America anymore. Boot camp can provide that opportunity. Yeah. Change of environment, career preparation, and honestly, a lot of times it does wind up boiling down to economic reasons. Okay. I was speaking with one of my veteran students yesterday who was telling me the story of, of himself and why he joined the Air Force. And it was because he was a very young man and he and his girlfriend had become pregnant together and he needed the money. He needed the, the resources that being in the military would provide. And, and the day he went into boot camp, guess what? The whole family was covered by medical benefits. That was something that he couldn't afford otherwise. So 
that's the reason he went. So there's a lot of different reasons that those 280,000 people are joining the services every year. All right, now, you make the decision, I'm, I'm gonna join the whatever, I'm gonna join the Coast Guard, I'm gonna join the Navy. What happens when you get there? Now we usually have a, a student panel when we do this at Cal State Long Beach and we like to ask people, well what's the transition like from the civilian world to the military world? And one of our, one of our student panelists said, yes, there is no transition into the military. One day you're not in the military and then the next day you are. <laughs> All right, well, the military is certainly a different culture and that's one of the big things we're here to talk about today. One of the big parts of culture is language. Okay. When you join the service, you have to learn a new one. Whichever service you join will have its own language. Now we're gonna talk about some of those terms here. Now if you have served in the military, please do not answer these questions and don't tell the people at your table either. What is a bulkhead? What is a bulkhead? Anybody know? We got a room of 200 people. Surely somebody knows. I see somebody pointing. Were you in the service? Well, you can't answer then. You don't know the rules? <laughs> what was it you said about discipline, Mr. Secretary? <laughs> Following directions. But since the answer's out there, it's a bulkhead. If you're in the Navy, the Marine Corps, or the Coast Guard, you may no longer call this a wall. Now, people in the Army and Air Force think we're a little foolish about that, I know. But it's a bulkhead, because that's what they call them on a boat, okay? What about a porthole? It's a window, not just the little round ones in a boat. The deck. I like to say that the deck is anything you can do push-ups on. <laughs> now, earlier today, you all had something that we in the military would call chow, okay? You don't, you don't go to lunch, you go to chow, okay? We don't go on vacation, we go on leave. What's a cover? It's a hat, right? But don't call it a hat if you're in the service. Someone will uh, redirect your language at that point, okay? We can't just go to the bathroom, right? If you're in the Army, the Air Force, you go to the latrine. If you're in the Navy or the Marine Corps, you have to make a head call. Figure that one out, right? Okay, now, this is one of my favorite terms. What are colors? What's that? The flag, right? But it's, it can be more than just the flag. Let me ask you a question. How many of you were up before the sun came up this morning? Okay. All right. What time does the flag go up every day? Not sunrise. Zero six some places. I know in the Marine Corps, it's 08, isn't it, gentlemen in the Marine Corps? Yeah, I see two heads that I know back there going, yes, 08, 08. Anybody know what time the sun is going to set today? Like to the minute? Anybody? Not like 441 or something like that? Now, if you were living on a military base, I guarantee you know what time the sun is going to set to the minute. And the reason that you know that is because that's when colors happens. Now, colors is either the raising or the lowering of the flag. And when colors happens, if you are standing outside, you must stop whatever you're doing, face the nearest flagpole when the music starts, and yes, music does start outside when the sun goes down, and you have to stand there and salute until the music stops and the flag is all the way down. Now, it's a lot of fun if you're on a base and you're inside a building to watch all the people outside the building do this. <laughs> And since they know what time it's gonna happen, they're kind of aware, so if anybody's anywhere near a door when that music starts, guess what happens? They sprint towards the door so they don't have to stand there and have everyone staring at them. It's always a lot of fun. But my very favorite part of colors is this. If you're driving in your car, when colors happens, you have to stop your car and sit at the position of attention while the music is going. I was in the Marine Corps for six years and no one ever fully described exactly what sitting at the position of attention meant. Yeah. But that's what you gotta do. 
All right. Now, if you have not had enough of military terminology, I would invite you all to go to Amazon.com. You can buy the Dictionary of Military Terms. It is 763 pages of insomnia-killing reading. And it's yours for only $18.75 from Amazon.com. That's on sale. It's usually $19.95, so get yours today. Uh, and you can get it on, exactly, get it online for free. Do you have one? Fantastic. All right. Now that's what I missed out on my dissertation. I should have put that in there. That would have made it a lot thicker. Okay. Now, one of the big things about military culture that winds up being missing when people get out is the chain of command. This is a really, really, really important part of military culture because you know where you stand when you're in the military in relationship to everybody else around you in the military. And you know that because you are wearing your rank on your sleeves or your collar. This is the Army's rank structure. And on the left-hand side over here, we have all of the enlisted folks, okay? the privates, the sergeants, the master sergeants, the sergeants major. And then we come over to the officers, the lieutenants, the majors, the captains, the generals. They wear the shiny stuff on their, on their collars so everyone else knows when they see something glinting in the sun, they have to salute them as they walk past. Very important. Now, the nice thing about that is, again, you know where you stand and you need, to, you need to salute all the people that are officers. Now, I like to ask people, how would you like it if on your college campus you had to salute all the administrators you walk past? <laughs> I find the administrators like that idea quite a bit, especially the presidents of the schools, right? I, I think it's a great idea. Now, the, the important thing about this is, is it represents who you are while you're in the service, and the chain of command is something that is actually established very strongly, which means that if, for example, you are the corporal who goes to your staff sergeant and asks him for permission to do something, and he says no, well, what does that mean? It just means no, right? And you certainly do not want to go to the master sergeant and say, well, you know, master sergeant, can I do this? And not tell him that the staff sergeant said no? Because I promise you the staff sergeant will find you later and make sure you never do that again. The chain of command is what it is. Now, that's important to know because after living in that kind of a culture for a while, when you get out of the service and you go to the college or the university and you walk up to the financial aid window and you ask a question and that clerk on the other side of the window says no, what's the answer really? Maybe. Maybe. Okay? It may simply be that that person doesn't have the authority to give you a yes. He or she will probably not be offended if you say politely, you know, I'd really like to talk to your supervisor. But a lot of times our veterans won't do that because they think that the person sitting there is the final authority. So we need to make sure we're educating our veterans to know that it's okay to ask someone else or else they just accept the no and they don't get what is rightfully theirs. Okay. Now, uh, we already talked a little bit about saluting, and these pictures are a little hard to see from a distance, but on the left-hand side, we have a Marine saluting the President as he gets out of Marine One. We have a sailor at the bottom. We have some airmen up at the top, and then we have a soldier who's guarding the Tomb of the Unknowns. And uh, they're all rendering the appropriate honors to whomever they are saluting or whatever they're saluting. But I want to talk a little bit about the uniforms because the uniform is something that is a very, very important part of the culture as well. And it's something that we don't really think about. We see them all the time, but we don't really think about what they mean. And the uniform is important because it carries history. It carries history in a couple of different ways. Number one, it carries history of the individual that's wearing it. You can tell a lot about a person when he is wearing his uniform or when she's wearing her uniform. You can look at the ribbons that they're wearing or the medals that they're wearing, the stripes on their sleeves. You can tell by the little hash marks on their sleeves how long they've been in the service. You can tell if they're a combat veteran, where they were in combat, if they served with distinction in combat. You can tell a lot by looking at that individual, just wearing their uniform. 
So that's an important thing. We don't really have anything like that in the civilian world, right? You can't really tell much by how most of us are dressed today. Sure, we might wear a lapel pin that you have to look really close at to see what it is. But that's about it. Now, the other kind of history that the uniform carries is the history of an entire service. It's, a, it's almost a huge, huge thing. I mean, look at the Marine Corps uniform. Look at the, the Army uniform, which they all, they all look very dark here. But you ever notice how the Marine Corps dress blues, the jacket is almost black, but the trousers are light blue? You ever wonder about that? You know, the, the Army uh, dress blues have a similar thing going. They have a very dark jacket and light blue trousers. Well, that's for historical reasons. You see, when those soldiers were riding across the Great Plains of the U.S. wearing their Army uniforms, that coat was not something that was very comfortable, especially out in the sun. So they wouldn't wear it. They would take it off and pack it away. It was not out in the sun, but of course they're wearing their trousers, right? And their trousers were out in the elements and they were fading in the sun and they were fading with the dirt and the coat wasn't. And then they put the coat on and it was a different color. Well, we carry on that tradition today by having the different colors, trousers and different color jackets. Same with the Marine Corps. That Marine Corps uniform has that really high collar, which I can tell you is not the most comfortable thing to wear, okay? And if you're on a ship protecting a ship, you're not going to wear that every day. But originally, those things were high leather stock collars to protect the Marines from saber blows. So when it came time for fighting, you'd pull that thing out and put it on. But guess what? Trousers light blue, jacket black. So we carry on that tradition. The Marine Corps dress blues, once you become a corporal, have a red stripe down the side, and that represents the Battle of Chapultepec, where over half of the non-commissioned officers and officers were killed or injured. Okay. And the uniform at that place where they were fighting had a red stripe. So now it's part of the tradition that once you achieve that rank, you wear a red stripe down your trousers. So that's a lot of history for a young man or a young woman to wear, isn't it? But more importantly, it's a lot of history for them to take off and not wear anymore. You know, when we talk to veterans, a lot of times they'll say, you know, I, I do miss wearing the uniform. I do miss getting to wear that uniform. Some of us, of course, just miss being able to fit in that <laughs> uniform. All right. The other thing that, that veterans often talk about missing is camaraderie. You know, when you're serving in the military, you're, you're working with people and you're playing with those same people because you live together. You get done with work, and if you're stationed at Camp Pendleton, you all go to the beach together, or you all go up to Disneyland together, or you go to San Diego together. You do not go to Tijuana together. That is just bad. <laughs> you do not want to do that, okay? But that kind of camaraderie is something that you give up when you go into the college setting, because everybody's got a life in college. You go and you sit in class, and when you're done with class, you leave, and everybody goes on their own way. Okay? Camaraderie gets built in a lot of ways. Now, it's very difficult to see, but in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that there are all of these fine young men holding up a telephone pole. And on that telephone pole, it says teamwork because one person's not lifting that pole by themselves. Okay? It's team building to do that. Okay? I always love the, uh, the Blue Angels photo there because I just cannot imagine flying an airplane four or 500 miles an hour, two feet away from another airplane, also flying 400 miles an hour. Now, in the lower left-hand side, what we see here is a color guard, and each one of those service members is holding the colors of their service. And, uh, you know, when we get out of the service, we kind of rib each other about the different services that we're in. If my other partners that I normally present with were here, we would have already been bashing each other about who was in the Army and who was in the Marine Corps and all of that. But in the end, we all recognize that we're all one team. Okay? That kind of camaraderie is there. And of course, I think the bottom right-hand corner really says it all. You don't build teamwork any closer than when you're relying on someone else for your life. All right, so how do you get there? Well, boot camp. It's the initial training that's required for everyone. And the idea behind boot camp is you are preparing people physically, emotionally, mentally for whatever life is going to throw at them while they're in the military, for combat specifically. Okay? 
it's tailored to the u unique needs and the character of each service because I promise you folks, each of the services has a very different culture. And it's got to be learned, and they do that teaching in boot camp. The self is replaced with the idea of the team. And in a society that really doesn't have any rites of passages, like I said earlier, boot camp will provide that. Now having said that, and because I am a Marine, I'm going to show you a little bit of boot camp. And it will be Marine Corps boot camp, which by the way is happening about three miles away from here, if you're interested in seeing that. Paris Island Marine Corps Recruit Depot. The transition from civilian into Marine starts right here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 10, One. I'm Private First Class Lund, Alpha Company, United States Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps because it's the number one most respected branch of service. Ah. I've always wanted to do something with my life, and I've always set high goals. Confidence and bearing is the key, you understand me? Yes, sir. When you, you join, you don't exactly know what's going to happen. Yes, sir! Onto the island, and everybody on the bus was scared, and drones started killing the bus, and was yelling at us to get off. We ran and got in the yellow footprints. Now, what you're going to do, you're going to get out and get on my yellow footprints. You understand that? Yes, yes sir! Straight up! Yes, sir! And I was shaking when I actually got here. I was nervous that it wouldn't make it, nervous that it would be too hard, but not nervous enough to where it would, it would keep me from completing it. Yes, sir! The drill push you to your limit because they show you what it's like to be in a combat environment. Keep the head with the elbows. Keep the with the elbows. Hey, 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 hey. This morning is going to be the graduation ceremony for Alpha Company and November Company. Five platoons of males. November Company has two female platoons. We'll all graduate together. My name is Private First Class Haynes. I'm so happy and so excited. To become a United States Marine, honestly, is the best thing in the world. I can't imagine anything I could have done better. When we say Marine Corps, it gives me chills because of what it means, because of the history behind the Marine Corps. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to Paris Island and this morning's graduation ceremony. I'd like to take the next few moments and talk to you about these young Marines standing before you today. They arrived on Paris Island over 12 weeks ago, blurry-eyed, scared, disoriented, yet eager to start recruit training. To come to recruit training, of course it's hard, but where would you be if you stayed home? The last 12 weeks have been one of the toughest in my life. Even though it was tough, what got me through was the motivation from my family and from my girlfriend to be proud that they can call me a Marine. As you leave Paris Island today, understand the pride and honor of our Corps rest personally and squarely on your shoulders. Serve proudly and with distinction. You are our future. Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present to you our nation's newest and finest United States Marine. a good feeling to leave, but you're going to miss the atmosphere, you're going to miss all the recruits. You get such strong bonds with the other Marines because you have to work as a team. Teamwork is essential in the Marine Corps. That's what the sisterhood and the brotherhood is about. It's about respect, just like a family. It is a family. Now I have to give a disclaimer. That's the pretty side of boot camp. <laughs> Anyone who's been there knows what I'm talking about. The idea, of course, with the film is to show that if you listen to what was being said at that graduation ceremony, they're putting responsibility on a new generation of service members. Now, it doesn't only happen in the Marine Corps. It just happened to be the one video I could find that had men and women both graduating at the same time. But that responsibility of carrying on a tradition and, uh, and our service members and veterans do that very, very well. 
So how long does initial training take? Well, it varies by service. The Coast Guard's about eight weeks and then they move on to uh, an A school. Now, it's very important to know that you want to know the terminology involved with your, cert with your veterans because you do not want to call a Marine a soldier and vice versa. They don't like that very much. So the official term that is used for Coast Guardsmen right now, we don't call them Coast Guardsmen anymore, Guardians is the term that they, they prefer. Some of them still go by Coasties, but Guardians is the official term. Navy, Sailors, they have eight weeks of recruit training and then go to an A school as well. The, the length varies by their job assignment. The Air Force has really recently extended their basic military training to eight weeks as well, and then they go on to their technical training. Uh, soldiers, right, call Army veterans, soldiers. They go to nine weeks of basic combat training and then their advanced individual training. And then the Marines, the crazy ones, do 12 weeks of recruit training, then go back for four more weeks of Marine combat training for anybody that's not going to be in a combat specific role. And then they go on to their, their military occupational specialty school and they continue to call themselves Marines until they die. We continue to call ourselves Marines until we die. All right. But it's not all boot camp. You know, life really differs a lot after you get out of boot camp and, and by service. So, you know, the, the culture of the different services is significantly different. My best friend in high school is in the Air Force even now. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. And, you know, I always thought he would be the perfect Marine. He wears a high and tight haircut all the time, even after 20 something years in the Air Force, which is a little bit odd, okay? His dad was a Marine, and I said, well, why didn't you join the Marines? You would have been perfect. And he said, yeah, but I wanted a better quality of life for me and my family. 20-something years later, he's very happy with that decision, okay? It differs by what you do. You know, the life of a combat infantryman is going to be significantly different than that of an admin clerk. They're both incredibly important, but the lifestyle that you lead on a day-to-day -day basis is significantly different. Where you are, where you live, you know, when I was stationed at 29 Palms, my life was a lot different than it was when I was stationed at Camp Pendleton. You know? It's not that there's no beach at both places. You, you have the beach at Camp Pendleton, and you know, 29 Palms is a beach, they just forgot to add the water. <laughs> so it's a, it's a different life, completely. Now, whether or not you're in a combat zone, obviously your lifestyle is gonna change pretty significantly as well. Okay? Large bases are like cities, and everything that happens in a city has to happen on a base, and the service members that are serving on that base fulfill all of those different roles. They have families. You get three hots and a cot, meaning you get fed and you have a place to sleep. You get paid twice a month. You get med full medical and dental benefits. Weekends and holidays off, as long as you're not on a deployment. And you get 30 days of paid vacation every year. There's a lot of people that are civilian folks that would love to have those benefits. Okay? It's not, life's not bad in, in that respect. Okay? But some things never change because wherever you are, you can be deployed anytime to anywhere. Okay? You wear uniforms every day, which, you know, doesn't seem like a real big deal, right? You don't really have to make the choice, though. You wear the uniform of the day. Physical fitness is part of the lifestyle. Some of us have forgotten. You're continuously training. You're always policing one another. And I don't mean you're throwing people in jail, but you know, when you are in the service and you run into one of your colleagues, your fellow service members, and, and you see them in their uniform, if something's wrong with their uniform, you tell them to fix it. Now, when you go into your office at work right now, <laughs> you might not want to do that. Okay? And, and you might not like it too much if your boss came and said, you really need a haircut, buddy. Okay? When I was in the Marine Corps, I remember someone saying one time, how often does a good Marine need a haircut? And we said, well, once a week we go get a haircut. And he goes, a good Marine never needs a haircut. So, okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Leadership is something that is part of the culture as well. You are always a leader of someone, even in boot camp, okay? If you ever do take the chance to go down to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot here in, in almost downtown, right next to the airport, they graduate a new uh, group every single Friday. You, you can go watch, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. If you haven't gone, I, I highly recommend it. I think it's nine o'clock every Friday morning they do one of these graduations. But 
you know, as that group of folks leaves the base, as they've graduated, the next senior group, the next senior company is the senior company now, and everybody knows. You can hear it when they march past. It sounds different. Their feet on the ground sounds different. And you can watch these 12 weeks, and you can see who is where in that chain. And you're always expected to be a leader of everyone else around you that follows you. In boot camp, even your, the date of when you got promoted. If you got promoted in August and your buddy got promoted in July, guess what? He outranks you. <laughs> and it, he'll let you know. It can happen. So leadership is part of the culture always. Customs and courtesies, we talked a little bit about that. Saluting officers, colors, ceremonies, promotion ceremonies, change of command. You know, we even have a ceremony about how to cut the Marine Corps birthday cake. Also a very touching moment. If you haven't seen it, recommend that too. And then, of course, the chain of command we already spoke about. So getting out is a lifestyle change. You become a civilian, but what does that mean? Right? You lose camaraderie. You've got to go get your own job and you get to pick what that's going to be. You have to choose what to wear. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal, right? But I had to figure out if I was going to wear the blue tie, the purple tie, the orange tie, what tie am I going to wear? Now, it seems like a simple choice, but you know, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was a recruiter. Now, imagine if I had taken my fashion sense from the Marine Corps. You guys have seen the Marine Corps recruiters. What do they wear? Blue pants with a red stripe, tan shirt with green stripes, black shoes, and a white hat. I think the fashion police would have a problem with that if I showed up that way for work. It looks good there, but out here maybe not so much. Okay? You've got to find your own housing, and eating can be a big deal too because you don't just get to go to the chow hall anymore. Okay? And if you consider McDonald's your chow hall, that physical fitness thing is going to go out the window too. You also become a veteran. Now, that's an interesting thing to become because what does it mean to be a veteran? There are some of us who never really even thought of that term for ourselves. I never even thought of calling myself a veteran. Yeah, I was in the Marine Corps, but I'm a veteran? Because in my era, being a veteran meant you were a Vietnam veteran. And it had all kinds of things associated with it that in some cases weren't that pleasant. So we didn't think of ourselves as veterans. We just, we had been in the service, okay? But veteran means a lot, and it's something that we want to develop then our veterans to let them know it's something to be proud of, and, and most of them are. So they have that pride in service, but there are some of our veterans who are going to be silent about their service too. And you know the difference on your campus. It's the difference between the guy that wears the Army t-shirt every single day, and then there's the one that you would never know as a veteran unless he tells you because it's just not something he wants to share. It's not something she wants to share. And I'll tell you, a lot of our female veterans do not want to share the fact that they were veterans because they don't want to be looked down upon. Okay? They, they, don't, they don't want the guy that they might be interested in to think, oh, she was a Marine? <laughs> I'm afraid of that, right? <laughs> Especially if you haven't served. Okay? It's a big deal. And when you talk to female veterans, a lot of times they'll tell you, yeah, that's just not something I want to talk about. I'll tell my close friends, but I'm not going to advertise it. Okay? A band of brothers a band of sisters. I'm waiting for it to be called a, a band of siblings, but it just doesn't have the right ring to it yet. And then, of course, the acquired sense of superiority over everyone who served in all the other services. Okay, you gotta become a student. You get to choose your own major. You have to select your own classes. You have to study, question authority. Isn't that what we want our students to do? Now, that's a little bit of a culture shift. Okay? You're not supposed to question authority when you're in the service. Now, there are instances where you do, and you're supposed to, and you have to, but we want that to happen all the time in the classroom. We want them to read something and say, well, I'm not so sure about this. I need to think about this a little bit deeper. So it's a culture shift. Being a fellow student. Imagine yourself being a 25-year-old college freshman, sitting in a lecture hall with 100 other students that are supposed to be listening to the professor, but instead, they're on Facebook. They're texting. They're talking to each other. Now, you're sitting in the back of the room, especially if you're a combat vet, you're, you're in the back of the room, so no one can walk in behind you. You're by the door, so you're, from your vantage point, you see all of that. It's kind of offensive, isn't it? Because you're there to learn. 
So becoming that fellow student is a culture shift as well. Of course, this is military graduation and that is college graduation. That's a significant culture shift. Now, our collective goal is to have folks move from the one on the left to the one on the right. So, how do we do that? What do we need to be concerned about? Well, we need to be concerned about the transitioning because, you know, the Department of Defense is a very, very large bureaucracy and each of the services are very, very large bureaucracies. What's the biggest office building in the United States? The Pentagon, right? Okay. That's huge bureaucracy and that bureaucracy filters down to the unit level and, and it's not that veterans are not familiar with bureaucracy. They are, they get it, they've had to deal with it. But when they get out, they come to the community college and guess what? They're trying to get to their civilian career but it's a completely different kind of bureaucracy. Then they go on to the CSU or the UC and it's another different kind of bureaucracy. So they're having to learn all the time. Our job at the community colleges, the CSU, the UC, is to help people make that transition out of that big bureaucracy of the Department of Defense and into a civilian career. Okay? And this is what it feels like when they get into college and they're trying to use their GI Bill and now they've moved from the biggest bureaucracy in the world to the second biggest one, the VA, and the third biggest one, us, higher education. All right, so what do we need? Well, these are the needs in colleges and universities today. We need admissions counseling and outreach, okay? And outreach doesn't mean you need to go recruit students, though you may want to, but you need to be out there talking to people and letting them know. A couple of weeks ago, I was at the Yellow Ribbon Reintegration Program that the Army Reserve puts on, and I was sitting there surrounded by for-profit colleges that were trying to recruit students who were in the Army. And they asked me, well, how, how's your prospecting going? I said, I'm not prospecting. My school got 70,000 applications last fall. I don't need to prospect. Well, why are you here? I'm here because they need to know my school got 70,000 applications and they need to prepare themselves if they want to apply here. Okay? They need to prepare themselves at the community college to make that transition. Outreach is critical. So for those of you that are working with students, I beg you, tell them they need to get good grades. Tell them they need to get good grades because if they don't, they're going to have a hard time getting into their school of choice. Okay? That's part of outreach. That's part of counseling. It would be great if we could get priority admissions. It would be great. We don't have it yet. Priority registration has just been extended to four years as hopefully we all know. Four years after leaving service. That's fantastic because we got to make sure that our vets are getting the classes that they need so they can use those GI Bill benefits. Because if they can't get into the classes, not only are they slowing their progress down, but if they don't have those 12 units that they need, they're not getting 100% of their housing allowance, which in Southern California is about $2,200 a month. That's a lot of money to lose because you couldn't get into the biology lab that you needed. Okay. Obviously, we need health care support. We need referral to that. Uh, the VA uh, has great facilities. We need to make sure that our people feel like they can go there and ask for help. Peer networking is important. We cannot replace the camaraderie that they found in the military, but we can certainly give some kind of a substitute by having caring people on a campus, welcoming campuses, and supporting the student veteran organizations as well. That's a very important thing that we can do. And of course, employment assistance is, is definitely critical. We also need to be aware of the situation on our campuses. We need to be aware that our students can get into a class and then find that it's dropped. It's canceled. Or they can't get into it because it's full. The section is closed. Okay? We need to help them get into the courses that they need. Priority registration helps that. But what about things like a controversial class topic? What happens if you're sitting, you're a veteran, you're an Iraq veteran and you're sitting in the political science class and the professor who is a very well educated person who is about 30 years old and has a new PhD and they're teaching you about Iraq and you've been there and you know what they're saying is not right. What do you do about that? Do you say, uh, excuse me, Dr. Johnson, but um, I don't think that's correct. Are you going to put yourself out there like that? Some of your veterans will. Most of them won't. 
because they don't want to put themselves out there in a situation where they're going to get a bad grade. They, they want to be successful in the class. So we have had situations on our campuses where a veteran's been singled out as the mouthpiece for a war that they participated in because it was their duty, but they don't necessarily agree with it either. How did they become the mouthpiece for it? Because the instructor pointed at them and said, you've been there, you tell us about it. And then as the students started going, well, that's wrong, why did you guys do that? He's now defending something and he's put in a position where he can't just stand up and leave no matter how bad he wants to. We had a situation like that on our campus. A student went back the next day to the instructor and said, you know, you really put me in an uncomfortable situation. I didn't really appreciate that. It was a mature thing for the student to do. Some students will just go off. We don't want that to happen either. But we need to be aware of that. We need to let our faculty know what's appropriate and what's not. Academic freedom allows them to say a lot of stuff, but guess what? This controversial subject, this Iraq war conversation was in an art lab. Why are we talking about Iraq in an art lab? It's not appropriate, okay? The unit deployment, we need to be aware. We have people that are service members. We have a lot of National Guardsmen. We got a lot of Army reservists. We got a lot of Marine reservists that are going overseas, they're being deployed. We need to be aware, we need to let them know what the process is to do that properly so they can get back into school when they come back easily. Okay. And this is the big one, anti-war demonstration on your campus. Anybody had those on your campus yet? Really? Nobody? We did. Arlington Cemetery of the West, they come and they'll set up thousands of flags on your campus lawn. Pictures of fallen soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines. Mock caskets with American flags draped over them. Okay. Now, what did people serve in the military for? To protect and preserve the Constitution, right? That First Amendment's a big deal. It's fine that those people are on our campus. That's what we support, freedom of speech. It's okay, They're, it's their political statement. However, you know, some of your veterans might not respond to that very well. So the important thing to do is let them know what's happening. Tell them where it's gonna be. You know what's happening down by your business uh, office? Send an email out to all your vets and say, hey listen, this is going on on campus right now. We support their First Amendment right to come out here and protest in any way that they want. But if you don't think you can engage with that property, maybe you should take a different route to your class today. Right? That's fair. However, if you think you can interact with them appropriately and have a calm conversation with them, that's fine too. Just be aware that they have a right to be here and we support that right. All right, so as I begin to kind of wind down here, let's ask some questions. What if the US just happened to reduce the military forces by about 32%? You guys hear anything about that recently? Mm-hmm, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And remember how many, what percentage of veterans are from California? 11. Guess how many other people are in California that are in the military right now at Miramar and MCRD and Camp Pendleton and all the Navy bases in San Diego and Air Force bases up in Northern California. Guess how many people got to California and said, hey, I like it here. I'm going to stay. What's that? It beats Oklahoma. I can tell you that right now. Okay. They're going to stay too. And guess what's going to happen? They're going to come to you. Actually, they're going to call me. I get calls all day, every day. How do I get in Long Beach State? My first question, have you taken any college coursework at all? Yeah, I took one class at Miracosta when I was stationed at Camp Pendleton. Congratulations, I tell them. You now get to go to the community college of your choice because you can't get into my school until you have 60 transferable units. So guess who they're going to see next? You guys, okay? They're coming. They're coming, okay? Half a million of them will be leaving the service. You know, we're pulling out of Iraq this year, hopefully Afghanistan in the next couple of years. They're gonna come here and they're gonna be looking for the GI Bill benefits because frankly, the, the employment market's not that great for vets right now. And I think, I'm being nice when I say it that way. They're gonna come to school, okay? Now, this happened in the US not all that long ago, about 20 years ago, a little less than 20 years ago, right after our first little excursion over in Iraq. Right after Desert Storm, they had reactivated a lot of people that had gotten out. They had called them back. They had sent the reserves over, activated them all. And then all of a sudden they realized, hey, that war didn't take very long. 
You remember how long that took? Anybody? What's that? Three hours, right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't too long, 100 hours, right? It, there was a lot of bombing that went on before it, but then at the end of that, they said, well, no, we're not going to Baghdad. We're done. We did what we said we were going to do. We're out of here. And, oh, my God, we have all these people that we reactivated. We got all these reservists that, that are activated. We need to get them out of here. We can't afford that. We're going we're gonna to take advantage of uh, the elder, wiser Bush said, the peace dividend, right? So people got out of the service. The difference this time is if we start to reap that peace dividend, the people that are getting out have served in combat in large numbers. And not just one tour, two tours, three tours. They're bringing that back with them. We have to be prepared for that because they're coming to us. All right, so what can we do? Well, you know, even if you don't work directly with veterans, you can still be an ally to veterans. And I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to do the following things. Support their academic freedom, their professional, personal, social success. Provide them with support, information, and assistance whenever we can. Respect their right to privacy and confidentiality. Don't out a veteran who doesn't want to be outed. It's not right. And then create a welcome environment for service members and veterans at your institution. And with that, I thank you for listening to me today. Enjoy the rest of your time.